Wow. Are you with me? Because he said, open your mouth and I'll fill it. I'm going re- to read a few passages. And we're going to get to my, 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 my theme here. Genesis 22. And what I may do, just for the sake of time, I may just read parts of this that I'm going to just share. And I want you maybe just to kind of digest it. This is the story. It's entitled, Abraham is Tested. Sometime later, this is Genesis chapter 22, starting at verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you about. Wow. Y'all. I need to stop right there. How many of you read these passages so often you think, well, that was his son. His only son. The promised son. The son that brought laughter into Sarah's life. And like, how in the world is that going to happen? Both to mom and dad and everybody who heard the promise. Now that I've given you something that's near and dear and so special to your heart, I'd like you to give it away. Not just give it away, but I'd like you to sacrifice your son. Your only son. It sounds like God, doesn't it? And it kind of sounds like Jesus. Follow me. Late the next morning. Are you following me? Early. Everybody say early. Aha. Key word. Early. No snooze alarm. No, I'll get around to it. Who's obedient? Who's hungry? Who's following the voice and the word of the Lord? Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he'd cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in a distance. What day was it? Third day. How many miles do you think he walked in a day? It was a long walk. I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, it wasn't in the backyard. It wasn't even down the street. How many miles, you know, in in the context of uh, ancient Middle Eastern history would a person and a donkey, I don't know, was it 20, 30 miles? It could have been a 60-mile walk. I'm just guessing. doesn't say exactly. But I'm telling you, it was a long walk. You know, tests and trials can seem like a long time. Not at me if that's true for you. They can seem like a long, no, this wasn't, hey, let's go out in the backyard and do this. It was a three-day journey. Abraham looked and he saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, then we will come back to you. Oh my gosh. I mean, you know it's good to slow down when you read the Bible. We will worship... And I will come back to you. We will worship. And we will come back to you. My gosh. He's a man of faith. Let me tell you some good news. He also sinned. He made some big mistakes. I'm not going to talk about that, but one of the, you know, when you preach the gospel, you want to say at the end of the message, what's the good news? Because gospel is good news. There's gospel in the Old Testament. There's gospel in the New Testament. And I want to say about Abraham. He was in one, in one state. You know, he got all fearful. And he said, yeah, Sarah's my sister. You know, like David, when he drooled on his beard, he didn't know what to do. So he said, Bleh. the king. You ever get fear in your life? I do. You know, you do things that are inconsistent with your normal behavior. Oh, it's just my sister. You can have her. Abraham, protect your wife. But I want to tell you, God didn't disqualify him. He forgave him and he used him. So he said, we will come back. So there's something in Abraham's heart that he saw into the distance. Somehow or another, we're going to get through this and God is going to take care of it. We will come back. Amen. Isn't that awesome? 
I don't use the word awesome too often, but that's awesome. That's awesome because I want to say this to you. Because when we read these stories, you want to say, well, Pastor Brian, where are we going at the end of this deal? You know where we're going? I want to see what I saw earlier. I want to see each of us draw closer to God. I want to see each of us draw closer one to another. In families, in the fellowship. Why? And I'm glad I said that because I forgot to complete the analogy. Because the Bible says, see, in the book of Acts chapter 2, you see, they were all together in one place. You know, there were 5,000 and whatever, 6,000 and uh, whatever, but now there was the 120 there. But here's what I, this is what I wanted to say, that God wants this fellowship to be powerful. Amen. You are powerful, but God wants to increase your power. Amen. Are you with me in that? And, and, and I don't know too much about the chemicals of either dynamites or bullets, but there are certain chemicals that you have to put together in order to create an explosive. Yes. You can't have scattered chemicals on the ground and say, okay, blow up. No, you have to take them. And those chemicals, whether it's a chemical in a bullet or it's a chemical in a stick of dynamite, you have to pack them together. I want to thank God that there are about 4,200 Sticks of dynamite called the Church of Jesus Christ around our city. Isn't that awesome? Amen. I would say that's us. They're 42. But the question is, are we close to God? We can be in a room. We can even be a big group in a big room. But the question God is asking, are you close to God? Are you drawing near to Him? And are we working on the one another's? How many of you know the one another's are really critical? Now, I've got this down real easy because you're invisible. <laughs> And one may not have that down easy, you know? But that there's something about the togetherness in family. Amen? Come on. Amen. The transformation of our, of our city. It's like a baseball diamond. Sorry, I'm using all these sports analogies. So. It's like first base. Everybody say first base. first base. You hit the ball, you run to first base. That's called personal transformation. Say personal transformation. That means me, 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 and me. Not me, my wife and my kids. That means, Lord, deal with the junk in my heart. Anybody have junk in your heart? No, no, we kind of stop blaming everybody. First base is personal transformation. This is the key to personal power in Christ. Second base. What do you think second base is? I'll just say it quickly. Second base is marriage and family. Am I breaking it down with you okay? Marriage and family, that means marriage and family. I want to do everything I can to, just to, to see the transformation working in my life as a married man with my wife and kids. That's my job as a priest of my house. Man, are you with me? Married men. That's second base. So first base is what? Personal transformation. Second base is marriage and family. Okay. What do you think third base is? Congregational. See, are you getting this? Because God has got a, it's real simple. It really is clear and simple. So when I'm dealing with my stuff, and then I'm just in my marriage, just doing as much as I can to draw close and be a good priest and be a good pastor to my kids and family, then the third base is congregational transformation. And you get the idea. As this church continues to grow in Christ and grow together in Christ, strong individuals and strong families make a powerful church. Are you with me? Because we're going somewhere with this. Because it is all about obedience. And what do you think home base is? It's the community. It's where we live. It's about obedience. But there's a great power dynamic. When we bring those components together, personal, family, congregation, there is something explosive that's already happening. I hear God just saying, I want to explode more in your midst. We need the explosion of the Lord. Because the Lord told me a few months ago, when I was at the Reinhard Bonnke uh, presentation, the breakfast or the brunch months ago, the Lord said, get ready for a shift in the city. Come on. I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't reacting to the, to the salad. No, the Lord just whispered. He said, get ready for a shift. Yes, Lord. I'm believing for that. Pastor Falou, did you feel a shift on Thursday night? Oh, yes, yeah, something. We all want to be a part of that. Well, I don't live in Houston. My church is out in Katy, but we're all part of Greater Houston. Do you know what I'm saying? We're part of the place where we root for their football teams and we go, you know, we go shop there. We want to see Greater Houston impacted. And three weeks later, the Lord said to me, before the shift must come the sift. Amen. 
before the shifting shall come the sifting. And you know what I need to do? I said, Lord, right here. Start right here. What's in my heart? Come on. Raise your hand. Close your eyes, everybody. No, this is vital. This isn't for the curious. This is, Lord, I, I want to be part, Lord. Something had to happen in Abraham's heart, right? To get to that place of obedience. Lord, I'm saying, I want to see the shift happen in Katie, right? I want to see the shift happen in Kingwood, in the North Channel. You know, in, in downtown, I want to see the shift around our city. But Lord, before the, as the shifting happens, there's a sifting. And I believe this morning, or this afternoon as we finish, we're going to leave some dross. Go ahead and put your hand down. We're going to leave some dross on the ground. And we're going to be clear. We're going to be closer to God. Because there's something about the story of Abraham that will release, release the power of God. We will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. He put the wood on his son. I'm thinking, Dad, what are you doing? Come on, moms and dads. Are you with me? When I think about the story of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac, I think about the intimate and the ultimate concerns of life. What is a spiritual need? You can define it a lot of ways. As a chaplain for 25 years and doing different things, a lot of times a spiritual need can be the ultimate and the intimate concerns of our lives. You know, those of you who are watching online, you know, God is saying there are ultimate and intimate concerns that you have in your life. But I want you to give all of those concerns to me, Amen. says the Lord. Amen. Is that a good word for us? Yes. Because we've got to stop singing the song. Wrong. The song that we sing wrong goes like this. I surrender most I surrender most, most to thee, my precious Savior. I surrender three quarters. No, please. This is not my notes. Forgot this, but I want to say this. Write it down. Jesus Christ. Say Jesus Christ. Repeat it after me. Jesus Christ. When he came into my life, he didn't come to fit in. He came to take over. No, if we're not careful, sometimes, regardless of where we live, we have to be careful about the gospel we imbibe. Because Jesus and God is not my heavenly vendor. God is not a cosmic Santa Claus. God is not my servant. I am his servant. Amen. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's a very important phrase because it's the truth. Jesus didn't come to fit in to your gig or to my gig. He came, what? To take, to take over. Let that sink into your spirit because that's where we're going. Abraham never would have taken this journey if he never would have known that about the God that he served. Are you with me? Can you say Amen. And that's hard. This is called full gospel Christianity. I'm not talking about some tongues. Are you with me? No, this is full gospel. It's called the whole Bible. And I believe in tongues and miracles and all that kind of stuff. But there are hard sayings in the Bible. And God is saying, I think prophetically to us this morning, hey, if you can get down the hard sayings of the Bible, you will become powerful. More powerful. Lord, help us to ingest so that we can take on the challenging, difficult sayings of the scripture so we can become powerful. Abraham answered, God himself will provide. Everybody say, God himself will provide. God himself will provide. The lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar. There he arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar. On the top of the wood, he reached down at his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord, everybody said the angel of the Lord, he called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I know you fear God. Oh my God. 
This is dramatic, folks. This is more dramatic than anything I've ever seen on television or on the movie screen. Do you hear what I'm saying? And by the way, it's not about movies and it's not about TVs. It's about the interaction of a man who, who was given his life to God on his day. He was trying to do his best to follow the Lord. And he was trying to sing the song right when he said, I surrender all. Amen. I don't understand it. But it was a test for the ages. Would you agree with that? Yes. I mean, this is, I don't get it. There was a ram. Right? There was a ram. He says, now that I know you fear God because you have not withheld him from me, your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there he saw a ram caught, in the, uh, a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram's sacrifices and burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. Everybody said the Lord will provide. And to this day on the mountain of the Lord will the Lord provide. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself declares the Lord that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. Isn't that awesome? And, though, and through your offspring, all nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants and they set off together. For Beersheba, and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. I want to say, brothers and sisters, to my title and to the interaction Pastor Flew and I had, I don't know how long ago, a stirring in my soul. Sometimes there is no ram in the bush. Sometimes there is not. What do you mean, Pastor Brian? Well, hey, I prayed for my dad to get healed when I was 16 and he died. Huh? You know, I, I had to embrace fatherlessness as a young boy. Did some crazy things for a couple of years. You know what I'm saying? Th- think about your own story. You know, I was saying, well... We, we, we had the priest come, and we, you know what I'm saying? Think about the, the times in your life. I don't mean to do this to kind of either to depress you or discourage you. Because it says in Romans, Paul talks about that our life and our whole outlook will be radiant with hope. How many know that in the midst of sorrow and struggle, it's very important to keep hope alive? Where there's much hope, there's much faith, there's much trust, there's much momentum, the kingdom, and kingdom progress. Many miracles. I think about... Different experiences. The Bible says in, 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 in uh, Proverbs 13, 12, a hope deferred, it makes the heart sick. But a desire fulfilled. What is the tree of life? And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, Lord, what, what have I gone through? What have you gone through where you were looking for the ram in the bush and it wasn't there? See, we've got to address those things because sometimes things happen that we would rather not to see happen. You know, a, a number of years ago, our daughter was very sick, was in the hospital and, and um, with a severe digestive condition. And we prayed, and I think Pastor Falu and Margaret maybe knew about that. And then there were a couple of brothers that came after a couple, three years, and was, every day was like, are you well enough to go to school, Haley? Every day for years. I mean, you know, that's difficult. And see, I, I, one time I preached in the service, and a guy interrupted me, and he got healed in the service, and I wasn't even preaching about healing. And the guy who got healed was a doctor. He interrupted me in the middle of my service. He said, I've never done this before. I'm thinking, I was preaching for a friend. I said, well, please don't do it now. No, he said, well, you were, where you were talking, the Holy Spirit came on me. I've had chronic back pain for six years. And the Holy Spirit healed my back. And he introduced himself afterwards. And he was a doctor. Isn't that awesome? But I want to say there's tension about the, th- the, the thing, what's called theodicy. It's the problem of evil. How many know we need to figure out how to deal with evil? And there are ways that we do that too. We don't, we don't deal with the evil. We, we turn to God with our hunger. And we turn to God with our questions. Well, I want to say that a couple of other brothers came to our house and the, the story is like this. One of the, the Lord showed one of the guys what our house looked like. He'd never been to our house before. They prayed over our daughter and for five years she was healed. She was free. Amen. Can we applaud the Lord for that? God showed up. 
Yeah, but in the last couple of years, she's been finishing up her studies there. In the last few months, I'm, just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. For several months, we've been, we've been you know, the, the thing came back. Have you ever had things come back that were once gone? Well, we're going to deal with that. So we're kind of praying through that. And so, you know, it's kind of an area of, of, of personal challenge. So I'm going to go bring her home in a couple of weeks. She's been in the hospital for 33 days, got out yesterday. I think when you're preaching, it's very important to kind of share a little bit about your own story because I'm not reading this stuff out of a book. Yes. It's as fresh as yesterday. Yes. I'm thinking, so Pastor Brian, what are you all learning in this? Oh, we're learning a lot of things. Because we've seen God move in a moment. I've seen people just hanging onto their hand in a, in a hospital room and, and just not even praying, but watching God heal them. Do you know what I'm saying? And I want to I wanna share a verse that's very important. It's, it's Psalm uh, 15, 115, verse 3. I don't know how many verses I'm going to get to, but I'm going to get to our point because I believe God wants to renew some of us because he wants to, to help us to have that hope that's alive again. Amen. In the midst of our sorrow and our sadness, at times we walk through the valley of Baca, the valley of tears. tears. Psalm 115, it goes like this. God is in heaven, does as he pleases. Yeah. Whoa. Now does that set the playing field pretty clear? I mean, I, you know, I'm still going to beseech God. But there are about maybe four, four answers that God will give us. One may be yes. One may be no. One may be uh, maybe. And one may be wait. God is in heaven. And he does as he pleases. When I read that, man, that just said, Lord, I worshiped. Yeah, I worshiped. You're in heaven. And, and you don't hear too many primetime service, uh, services or sermons on this. You know, uh, not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, take this cup away from me. No, it's in the midst of that we find ourselves in what's called the crucible, the refiner's fire. Maybe you're there, maybe you're walking through kind of a time where these things happened, there was no ram in the bush, whatever you did not want to happen, happened. See, that's what I mean. What do you mean, Pastor Brian, no ram in the bush? That means you'd hope for a happy ending. But I want to tell you, ultimately, it's a happy ending. Ultimately, it's a happy ending. It's not a happy, it's a joyful en en ending. It says in Romans 15, verse 13, Paul, who wrote a lot of his letters in prison, he said, hey, I signed up for this thing to follow Jesus, and I spent so much of my time doing prison ministry. He wrote a bunch of the Bible out of prison. Come on, think about that, brothers and sisters. No, he said in one place in the book of Acts, he said, you know, the Lord told me to get on this boat and head to Jerusalem. He also warned me. Everybody say warned me. He warned me that there's going to be some hard times facing you. He didn't sing. Paul didn't sing, I surrender. I surrender most. No, he's saying I surrender all because he knew that whatever he went through was going to work out to advance the gospel. That your whole life and outlook may be radiant with hope. In 1 Peter chapter 4, it talks about fiery trials. So let me just say this to you. I'm going to do some ABCs with you. As you think through the, the, the issues that you're going through, there are probably four things to think about. A would be, very simple, A would be, what happened? B, these are all good questions, right? What happened? B, can you see that? How do you feel? How many know God is concerned about how you feel? The Bible is filled with feelings. The psalmist David? I mean, he just let it all hang out. Because he was just trying to keep in dialogue with deity. In the midst of the, the disappointments and the struggles, here's what happened. What do you feel? And C is what do you think? How do you think about what happened? What do you feel? But how many of you know if we just stay with A, B, and C, that could be a despair? What happened? What do you think? How do you feel? I mean, if, it's, if that's all there is, then it's kind of just like it's me, me, and me. But David said, what hope in God? Are you with me? In D, oops, there goes A. D, what does God and his word say about it all? Come on. I see that sometimes we're doing A, B, and C pretty good because we're pretty analytical. We're thoughts and feelings and we can describe events. But how many of you know that God just doesn't want us to describe events? He wants his perspective on everything that's happening. Are you with me? So what we have to do in our spirit, we have to arise and get to the place where we say, Lord, this is what I think, this is what happened, this is what I feel. 
What is your word to me? What is your word to me? Genesis 50, verse 20. Joseph, I don't have time to preach on that. I'm just going to mention it. Well, everything he went through, betrayal and all that, he turned to his brother and said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I, mean, you know, God, I want to declare over you, God has promotion Amen. over your life. Amen. Not intimidation, Amen. not despair. Yes. No, we've got to ingest, not just read, but ingest and digest the scriptures. Psalm 119 is one of my life verses. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I love thy law, O Lord. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Well, that's my story. When my knees started, you know, going whack on me and my dad died, I started saying, Lord, I'm thirsty. Amen. And he heard my cry. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Hunger and thirst. Refiner's fire. Don't have much time with that. I'm going to share a couple of things and we're going to pray. In the midst of that, I just say, there's a few things for you to do. Get to this very clearly. When there's no ram in the bush. Okay? Number one, be honest in your prayers. God's not going to get nervous. But when I cried out to the Lord, be honest in your prayers. Number two, Stay in the scriptures voraciously. Why? Because the, the, the scriptures reveal the heart and the thoughts of God. How many of you know we need God's thoughts? We need D. That'll stand for deity. Right? We need God's perspective. Number three, personal worship. I love corporate worship, but there's something about, well, I can't sing. Well, they'd make a joyful noise, for heaven's sake. Personal worship is, is, thir is, is the third one. Number four, be with people who have a Joshua and Caleb spirit. I mean, you know, when you're going through a funk, you don't need Eeyore, oh, you'll never make it, or some negative birds to make you feel worse. No, you get in the faith zone with people of faith, you know, I'm struggling, and I'm not talking about it, I'm talking about my own deal here. I want to say, so be with people of a different spirit. How many of you know, you just need people who are part of the Joshua and Caleb club that aren't saying, I don't think we're going to make it, let's retreat and go back. We need, how many you need a different spirit? You want a different spirit because there's great things ahead of us because I want to say to you. So what's this all about, Pastor Brian? Because there are giants that are waiting for your smooth stone. Come on. It's not just about being right or just doing right. It's about that so we can be on the team, in the game, filled with power because there are giants in the land that God has designed for you and your family, you and this church, you and this community, in our city. Would you agree there's giants in the land? And stop leaving the job to someone else. So it's got to be, we do all this, we walk through this, we, we seek the Lord, we say to God, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. Amen. And we hang on because we believe the breakthrough that something that we sang about earlier is going to shift. Amen. Hold on for the shift, brothers and sisters. Amen. The next one is increase your caloric intake. What do you mean, Pastor Brian? You want me to get fat, er, fat, big? I, no, I don't mean that. What I mean is... I learned this. Have you got any nurses in the crowd? Doctors? Raise your hand if you've got any medical people here. When I worked in the burn unit, one of the, one of the, uh, the remedies for burn, burn patients, very interesting. And I worked in the burn unit at, at Herman Hospital for about a year. I've worked with burn patients. And, and one of the prescriptions for getting the well was to increase the caloric intake. Healing. What do you mean calories? I mean spiritual stuff. I don't mean attack the refrigerator more. <laughs> I mean, go for God. Put on tapes, CDs, worship music. You know, meditate on the scripture. Increase your caloric intake. That will keep you in the faith zone. Are you with me? Is this making any sense this morning? No, I'm just saying increase your caloric intake. I didn't read that in a book. When I've gone through the refiner's fire you know, with our daughter, I think, Lord, I just need more calories. I started reading the 90-day Bible. Read the whole thing and I think I need more calories. Are you with me? Is this sinking in? Because when there's no ram in the bush, we have decisions to make. Because I want to stay in the game. Raise your hand if you want to stay in the game. You don't want to be taken out because when there's no ram in the bush, sometimes you say, well, I just think I'm going to, whatever. No, it's not about disengaging. It's time to engage. Amen. Increase your caloric intake. 
I'm going to share one more thing. Quick story. Can I have five more minutes, Pastor Falu? Just five more. I might need five more. Okay. Can I have five more? Is there a guy came to the hospital. A car hit him. He was an evangelist. He lost both his legs. I met with him. And I said, how are you doing, so-and-so? He said, I'm blessed and can't be cursed. I felt his pain. His name was Teddy. It was hard because I can tell he was trying to say all the right things. You hear what I'm saying? But he needed to find a safe place to be honest. Short version. I'm going to speed it up. Met with him, talked with him. He began to pull the mask back. He said, you know, who's going to, what am I going to do now? I'm, I'm a pastor. I don't have no legs. And who's going to want to marry me? He's a single guy. You know, there was a crisis. I'm going, that's a real big crisis. I've worked with several guys in the hospitals who've had horrific situations. But this, this is what happened to this man. He said, I thought, but you want to just stay with people. What do people need when they're going through pain? They need the assuring presence. You can write this down if you want. Of someone who's not secretly and silently running away. Are you with me? When people are in pain, when there's no ram in the bush, when things didn't work out so well, we're going to believe that God is in the refiner's fire. He said, I shall come forth as gold. There was a word from the Lord for Teddy. As I interacted with him several times, I sat there, and I believe, I'll just mention this in my last verse, and then we're going to pray. In fact, stand up with me, if you will. That'll help me finish faster. There is that last verse. Job 42, 5. I said this to him. We can get a little music going there. Thank you, sirs. I appreciate this worship team here very, very much. I said, I was at a Methodist hospital, and I thought, I think the Lord's just given me a prophecy for this guy. What I want to say to each of you, very important. If you don't get anything, get this. Turn to someone next to you and say, get this word right here. Okay, when there is no ram in the bush, there is a word from the God, from God. Amen. Come on. Amen. Tattoo, no, there is. When there is no, come on, applaud the Lord. When there's no ram in the bush, there is a word from God. And this is what I told him. And his mom was sitting right there. I'm thinking, I'm in a Methodist hospital and I'm feeling a prophetic utterance for Teddy. And this is what I told him. I said, hey, I don't know if you believe in this or your mom believes in this, but I think I want to tell you something. How I many you know when you prophesy, you can just be natural? I think the Lord is saying, the enemy tried to destroy you. In fact, I'm going to say this to you. To you. <laughs> through the things you go through. I said this to Teddy. I'm saying this maybe to anybody in this room. The enemy tried to take you out. Have you ever had those experiences? Where the enemy, you know, the enemy tried to take you out. But the Lord preserved your life. Amen. And I said to him, I said, the Lord is telling me, and his mom was sitting there going, huh, this is a chaplain in a Methodist hospital prophesying to, to my son. He's about 40 years old. But the Lord has a new assignment for you. The enemy tried to destroy you, but God is going to promote you. Amen. Come on, inhale that word. Come on, that's, that's not just for Teddy, that's for each of you. That's for this church, the enemy comes in like a flood, but the Lord raises up a standard. The, 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 the Lord, the enemy tried to destroy you, but God's going to promote you. I'm saying this to this group here. Like I was in that, come on. I'm saying God, well, it's about promotion. It's not demotion. It's not about despair. Keep breathing in hope. And then he has a new parish for you. I'm thinking, parish, that's interesting. And he wants you to minister into the parish of the afflicted. I'm going, wow, that's a deep thought. No, it just came like a reader board. Everything that God has, that, that the enemy even has done in your life, or God even has allowed, he will work for good. Because he wants to make you more powerful, more you like Jesus. Because when we go through that refiner's fire, we take in more calories. Yes. The good stuff. I'm not talking about eating Twinkies when you get depressed, like sometimes maybe I've done. Come on. Let's eat the good food. Because the Bible says there's secret food. There's special food for those that overcome. So I said this to him. And guess what? He received the word to minister in the parish of the afflicted. And one day I was walking by the TV. And I looked up. 
No kidding. As God is my witness, this guy Teddy was on national TV sharing his testimony with the world. No, that was in room 902, a little room in a hospital, a place for deep, ultimate. Do you get the, do you get the Abraham story? Ultimate, intimate concerns. We can give it all to God in the midst of things, though things become shattered. I said to him, the Holy Spirit saying, he's going to cause you to minister into the, the parish of the afflicted. That means he's going to use your story to bless others. Amen. That's awesome. Amen. Would you say that? I said, there he is, Kelly. He's on national TV. Teddy, the Lord is fulfilling his word. But I want to say real quick, and I'm just going to say a prayer and let you go. If you feel like in your spirit, the Lord is saying, you know, Lord, I don't want to draw back. I want to, I want to press forward. I got a blue line right here. If you feel like you're kind of in even the furnace, the fire, the, what do you call it? Uh, refiner's fire. Maybe you just need the Lord to touch you and release you. I'm going to invite you right, right now. Just come forward and cross that blue line, if you will. There's something special. And maybe Pastor Flew, when I'm done praying, I'm just going to hand it back to you. I feel excited. No, I, I, I feel empathic for whatever you're going through, but I just say, Lord, I don't want to shrink back, right? I want to press forward. If you're just feeling across the line, make sure we can get across that blue line. We're saying, Lord, I'm crossing the line again. You know, it's not like a backslider. I just need to sort of say, Lord, I'm going to press through because I want to be a part of, of your family, of your army that is going to be doing great, great and mighty things. I feel an excitement. He's been doing great things in your lives, but he's saying in the midst of trial, don't shrink back. Don't shrink back. I surrender all. Sing it with me. I surrender all. Come on forward a little bit more. All to thee, my precious Savior. I surrender all. You can just lift your hands if you will. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my precious Savior, I surrender voice. Let's sing it to the King. I surrender all. This is awesome. I surrender I surrender all. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. I surrender all. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I surrender all. Thank you. say this together and I'm going to pass it to, to Pastor Falu. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I, love I love you and today, and today I, pledge I pledge my allegiance to you. I declare that no weapon formed against me will prosper but as a planting of the Lord I will prosper. Thank you Lord Jesus. I affirm you're my Savior. You're my Lord. <clears throat> Because you've gone through it, I can go through it. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're shaping me into a vessel of honor, a vessel of power, a vessel of your hands. I declare, Psalm 1, I am a planting of the Lord. And whatsoever comes my way, I will prosper. I will thrive. 
I will prosper. I will thrive. And I will be a man. I'll be a woman of the smooth stone. Look here, everybody. Right here. I'm going to leave this at your pulpit. This is about God doing works. It's not about, you know, just going through stuff. It's you going through stuff because he's shaping you. He's, he's, he's bringing you through refiner's fire so that you can be even more like Jesus and more powerful and we'll see more victories. And I just say that and just prophesy that over each of you, your pastors and all who would come here. So just hold your hands like this. I'm going to say a prayer and give it to Pastor Falou. So Lord, we just thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord, for the story of Teddy. And that's our story. We've gone through stuff, Lord, and the stuff that I just would rather not happen. But we're just saying, Lord, we trust you. You are working it out, Father. And Lord, it's about us experiencing your love, your cleansing, and your power. So I bless and release my brothers and sisters in River of Life family, church, to your name, to your nature, and to your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please stay. Please stay. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Um, last Sunday, I was standing over there, and the Lord spoke to me and said, look for your ram in the tricket. Last night I saw in the email that Pastor Falou sent out that your message today was going to be when there's no ram in the tomb. What do you do when there's no ram? Mm. And it was just kind of like, ooh. <laughs> so I want to encourage all of you who are here. I've looked for a ram for a very long time. I have watched God take me through the fire year after year after year after year after year. Waiting for that ram in the trinket. And in the process, has done in me Jesus. <laughs> more than I could ask or think. There has not been one day where he has left me. Jesus. There has not been one day where he has forsaken me. And he has shown up for me when I didn't even know I needed him to show up. Because I found out after the fact. So I encourage you Thank today. You. Keep watching. Yeah. For your ramp and trick it. If you trust in what God has done for you at the cross of Calvary, yeah, yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter how long it takes. Your ram will show up in the trinket. Yeah. Amen. 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 New thought. When there's not a ram, there is a lamb. Jesus. Are you with me? New thought. Come on, let's applaud it. If there's not a ram, Pastor Falou, the lamb, he's better than the ram. He's the one. He's the one.